Welcome back to Nickelodeon's Comic Corner, classic slash non-classic. This is episode number 631 and double shot number 535. I got two Larry books to review and for this episode and the following one because I figured, oh, it's my show. I can do whatever I want on it. And it's two X-Men related trades. And the next episode is also two X-Men related trades. This one we got... X-Men Blue, Volume 2, 3, Cross Time Capers, and X-Men Gold, Volume 4, The Negative Zone War. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about awesome titles for these books. Mm -hmm. Let's start with Volume 3. Now, those of you curious, though, okay, if this is Volume 3, why are these particular issues in here? The issues in here are issues 16, 20, and there's also material in here from, actually, that's another book, but yeah. Those of you curious, there's about three issues missing here. Oh yeah, there's an explanation for that. Uh, the Crosser Mojo War. They th they said throwing that into the third volume of X Men Gold, so that is where they are. The story for this one is this: the X Men apparently someone's altering the X Men's history, and and they're um like apparently Magneto apparently dying at the first parent when when the yeah, when one of the times the X Men about the Brotherhood. And the brother be killed as well. So they go into cross time. They go investigate, and the first place they ended up is the future, ending up in 2099, meeting up with the X Men 2099. First, and these these guys have shown up since, off the top of my head, I think it might have been, uh, 2099 New World Order. There's, so basically, it's been almost 20 years since this first, since this group has been seen. It's great to see these guys, and Beast got himself some future tech, and it's still sticking around. Yeah, it's surprising that he, his, the only future tech he got was near peace. Yeah, surprising though he he got that, though. I think he still has it, but I don't think he uses it. Then they ended up, and they go try to figure out how to get back to their own time. Then they ended up in the 90s. Yep, meeting up with Generation X. No, not the recent version that Marvel ended this year after really after issue number 87. I'm talking about the original team, the one with Jumbo Lee on the team, along with a bunch of other people. Yeah, this team was originally started by Get This, and this is no joke of who created this group. Uh, from what I remember, I think it was James Robertson and Chris Bachelow. Yeah, they're the ones who actually started, they're the ones who created the group. But the series was initially cre uh, written by Scott Lobdell. And that's them right there. That's the, that's the original Generation X. With characters like Chamber, who was actually involved in the most recent Generation X series. Jumbly and a bunch of other characters. Let's see if I can find him on here. Yeah, Generation X was originally a 75-issue comic book that, well, was part of the 90s, per se. Yeah, it was published in the 90s, and the, yes, they even had a, a brief movie, and I've seen part of it, but... Yeah, this was the original lineup for the group. Okay. It basically it was run at Massachusetts County, which is a boarding school. And now the group was created by I thought it was James Robinson. I forgot. The group was started by Scott Lovedell. Yeah, the same guy who did the new 52 Run for Teen Titans. That Scott Lovedell. But I was correct about the artist being Chris Botchlow. This is a lineup, and some of you are like, okay, some of these people are actually been part of the X Men at some point. But yeah, this was the original lineup: Banshee, Chamber, Emma Frost, Gila. Husk, Jumbley, M. This is also Monette. Mondo, Penance, Skin, and Snythe. Yeah. Skin, uh, far, far as I can tell, I don't think he's still alive. No, I think that, um, I'm trying to think, what was his name? Oh, yeah, uh, Chuck Austin killed him off. Yeah, during the controversial two-parter Holy War. Yeah, he killed off this guy there. Jumbley is still fine, though she was a vampire. Now she's back with rich powers. Emma Frost is still around, doing whatever the heck she wants. Banshee died in the Deadly Genesis miniseries, but was resurrected twice. For, actually, he was resurrected three times. First for Nerosha, then he was resurrected for... for uh, was kind of basically... Marvel's take on brightest, well, early take on brightest day, which was 
Chaos War. He's resurrected for that. He was the leader. Well, he was he was one he was one of the two people who was leading the the Chaos the the resurrected uh, Dead X Men, and he was resurrected again by Rick Remender as part of the the Horsemen of Death. Husk has been he she was a recurring character in Wolverine the X Men, and up until just before the end of the run. I don't think she's evolved much anymore, but yeah, she was a woman, Husk, who had the mutant ability of ripping off her own skin to be more and more skin underneath. Though, at one point, she got, she got like too much skin on her, so it took Toad, uh, uh, who was the janitor at that point, though he's back being villain, a, a guy who was in love with Husk, so he basically uh, went nuts, ripped a bunch of skin off, and she was perfectly normal. Of course, at that point, she was... Uh, Shedding skin like no tomorrow. Monette was part of Peter David's awesome uh, X Factor one. Though he, she was also part of the X Men. I don't think she is. She she was also part of Generation X, uh, the most recent book where she was cured of her uh, thing where she was briefly possessed by her brother. Yeah, the guy who, and plate. Uh, as for the character Mondo, I don't think this character is still around. I don't think so. Oh yeah, he actually reappeared recently, but yeah, he uh, doesn't do very much. Yeah, this is a character of pretty much nothing. Penance. Yeah, she's uh, let's see if I find a picture here. She actually recently appeared in the Excelsior miniseries. Uh, the the group formed by of all people, Rick Jones. Yeah, he was the financier of the group, and the group was kind of, well, it was, how should I put this? They were a group of people who were, there she is right there, the woman in red. Yeah, this is the entire original lineup of the team, minus Emma Frost and and uh, Banshee. Mm -hmm. There was Lavery Revolution, and it turns out the people behind all this the uh, manipulating time and they get back to the was what actually really is their correct timeline and uh apparently xavier had been put under sedation by another charles xavier if you wonder who this other charles xavier is it's charles xavier's evil son and yes this guy has a brother his name is legion who was also the star of the popular legion series in fx and then it turns out the pe people who manipulating timeline in this particular arc is none other than the Brotherhood of Evil X-Men. The characters made a debut back in Battle of the Atom, who then reappeared uh, in the second arc of All New X-Men, set after Battle of the Atom. They appeared there. They disappeared. I mean, when they appeared last year in this particular book, excuse me, off the top of my head, I think this was the first time in probably three years that this group has been seen. And at the end of this, it's implied that Magneto of the past, it's implied that he killed them all. Yeah, it's very heavily implied. Yeah, it's like, okay, wait, we're, we're going to try this again. And Magneto's like, no, you're not going to try this again because I'm going to kill you all so you don't try this again. Otherwise, this was by far a really good story, though my friend Tiffany doesn't like time travel, but... It's one of the emphasis of the story, time travel. But one thing I praise about the story is the fact you see the return of Generation X and X Men 2099. I mean, X Men is not one of my, it's not one of my favorite titles, 2099 line. I've read all the issues. It's an okay title. But here's kind of the weird thing about it: Marvel only released one other one classic book that collected the original series, which only collected the first nine issues of the series. Yeah, and for some reason they stop after that. Though they did collect one other issue uh, in the Spider-Man 29 Classic uh, trades, which were almost uncollect the original series. But as for X-2099, nope, they never finished collecting the series. X-Nation was a spinoff of it. That was by far enough on the trade. Yeah. What are we going to give this? I'm going to give this a 9.5 out of 10. It's really good. That's one thing I praise about this series in blue. Even red. They're all three really damn good titles. Next up is Gold, though after this particular storyline, uh, Old Man Logan leaves the team. Yeah, it was after this very storyline. This book collects issues 16 and 20. Oh, I almost forgot the, uh, the creative team of this book. Uh, Blue was done by Colin Bunn, 
with artwork by the first issue done by uh, Tony Salas with uh, the cover of this entire thing is now by Arthur Adams. He does all four issues in here. Yeah, he's been doing it since issue one, doing the cover. His artwork is really good. And then the remaining four issues done by R.B. Silva. Really dang good artist. This one is done by Mark Guggenham. He's been around since issue one. With Luke Ross, who did issue 12. He did the artwork for that. Issue 16 is done by Len Medina. 17, 18 is Ken Lashley, who actually worked with Colin Bunn on Kenny X-Men. Issue 19 is done by Diego Bernard. And issue 20 is done by Lean Menita. But Ken Lashley, uh, despite not being the interior artist for all these issues, he actually does these fantastic covers. Yeah. The story for this one is this. The X-Men are basically enjoying a good amount of success, and also the whole thing about their the Mutant Deportation Act is is not popular with people at all. So people are launching protests against it because of how unpopular it is, due to the fact the X-Men are recognized by New York City as as heroes, and they're being loved. But this is kind of a, this is for to me anyway. This is a step in in a, in a right direction, especially as how piece of crap of an idea the Mutant Deportation Act is, especially as it's a play on the immigrant. It's it's basically uh, playing on people's fears about immigration. Yeah, I have no idea what Guggenham tried to do that for. Luckily enough, I'm not doing that. And then at one point, uh, there's an alien invasion in the York, but but the date, like, I think it's just on the same day, uh, Kitty Pride invites Colossus to a hotel room where they, where they off-panel have sex. I'm not kidding. Kitty takes Colossus to have sex. Possibly the first of these two have ever had, had sex. Well, not since Matt Fraction's run for Kenny X-Men. I'm not kidding. It's been that long. I think it's been roughly... Off the top of my head, I think it's... At this point, it's been almost seven years since these two have actually had sex. Because, well, he's had sex with Domino several times in the Cable X-Force series. And then Rachel basically, uh, when she's trying to contact uh, Kitty, uh, wondering like where 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 uh, Colossus is, she's like, uh, he's here with me. And then, of course, she, she, she kind of notices what they what they did, and she and she's and then and then and then Pestilence, aka Rachel Gray, says, tells Rachel, "You dog." <laughs> yeah. I think she's just very happy with the fact that Kitty and, and Peter are back together. And then this storyline ends, well, but at one, and also the aliens, uh, who actually from the negative zone, by the way, kidnap Kitty Pride, take her to the negative zone. I'm kind of like, okay, she's the leader of the X-Men, but why take Kitty for? She can pass through walls. I mean, she's not like a person with a high amount of information for these aliens to get. I mean, why would they kid out the leader of the X-Men? It would make more sense because a politician than kid out the leader of the X-Men. Yeah, and also, yes, they actually do start wearing these costumes in here. Yeah, apparently these are force you protect the ones too, because Negative Zone causes emotional trauma where people go in it. Though apparently the Fantastic Four have no problem going, the, going in there, no problem. Yeah, the Fantastic Four have visited the Negative Zone, no problem over the years. Now, my personal guess is the reason why they had the actual Negative Zone, probably because Negative Zone not much had how much spotlight since that Escape from the Negative Zone story back in 2010. Yeah, it's been like at this point, like when this came out last year, it had been roughly seven years since since the uh, X Men actually went to Negative Zone. Anything dealt. I actually, I think the only other time I could think of people, Marvel has actually had revisited to Negative Zone was the Hulk vs. Thanos mini series written and drawn by Jim Sterling. But for the X Men, this is the first time since Escape from Negative Zone. This one, this one actually has a lot better artwork than that particular story. Mm -hmm. Though the Rescue Kitty, along with the X Men Gold lineup, they also had Armor and a few other people. Now I'm thinking Armor. Armor graduated a long time ago, and yet, at this point, they have her back being a student for some reason. And now she's back in the X-Men. It's really bizarre. 
It's kind of like some of these newer characters. Marvel, the writers of the Xbox have no idea what to do with these characters. I've been thinking of doing an open topics video about the other, uh, all the other X Men who are not the big name X Men characters, uh, who who made their debut in the past like 18 years. That apparently X Men writers have no idea what to do with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then of course the ending of this thing sets up something that is going to come out next month: the wedding of Colossus and. Kitty Pride. Let's hope this one goes through because the last wedding proposal was three years ago and it was Star Lore proposing to Kitty Pride, which she accepted, and then after Secret Wars, the engagement is over. Yeah. For some reason, as far as I know, to this day, there has never been an explanation for their uh their ending of their engagement. As far as I know, when it comes to this particular one, this one's happening. In the case of Star and Kitty Pride, this is something that Bendis set up, and apparently, uh, the only other writer gave a damn of this relationship aside from Bendis was Sam Humphreys. Aside from that, no one cared to do anything with this relationship at all, which was bizarre. So, for Kitty Pride, after spending about two years in space, actually, it's about a year in space, she comes back to Earth and she can take several years to the X Men. Which is a step in the right direction. I like the fact that, that for this book, finally. We take something that we we put it behind us and move forward new ideas like another X marriage. Which is this is actually going to be the first one since North Star's marriage back in I'm trying to remember I think it was back in 2012. Yeah, this was the last X Men marriage happened in Astonishing X Men number 51. This came out roughly about six years ago. Yeah, and this is interesting though that the X Men are going to do in our wedding. But the other wedding I think of in the past six years, aside from this one, was Deadpool marrying uh, Sakila, I think her name is, the woman who's also a demon, uh, demoness vampire, who Deadpool was married for for several years. And then, of course, the marriage somehow fell apart because of the his part. And then, of course, Doug had pretty much erased uh, the marriage from Deadpool's memory, even though legally everybody else remembers that he was married. Mm-hmm. This is great. I'm going to give this a 9.5 out of 10. It's really damn good. And I can't wait for the next trade, which is gonna just going to be a countdown to the big wedding. Now, I'm a little surprised they decided not to throw in the annual in here. I would have thought, basic when the annual came out, I think it was just, just after issue 20, the same thing for uh, X and Blue. X and Blue, I kind of get the reason why they didn't throw that in that trade. This one, there was not a reason why. No. Uh, Blue, because it's the start of a crossover with Venom, which, by the way, is one of two crossovers that Venom gets involved with. Yeah, I have another one on order from the library. Okay, so, that's it for this episode. Stay tuned for the next episode, which is going to be episode number 500, uh, 632 and double shot number 536. Where I'm going to cover two more X-Men trades, okay? Until you see you in the next episode. Bye.